Hello friends, welcome back to English Classes Online. My name is Benjamin. In today's video, we shall be looking at literature in English in the West African Senior School Certificate Examination. This lesson is a preparatory lesson for 2021 exam. And our focus will be on how to answer questions on general knowledge of literature. This video is being uploaded in response to specific requests from some of you, our highly esteemed subscribers and uh, viewers on this channel. I want to mention specifically two of you, Abu Kamara and quotes and stories. If you are watching this video, you specifically requested for this video on literature. In your direct words, you actually uh, came out to ask me to begin to introduce videos on literature. Let me begin with the words of quotes and stories. Uh, you said, thanks very much for taking your time at least to reply to my comment. I was wondering, sir, if you could please help us in literature in English. That came from quotes and stories. And then from Abu Kamara, I hope I got that pronunciation quite correct. You said, I want you to be introducing literature in English. So I am dedicating this um, video on literature in English to two of you who specifically requested for it. And I know there are many of you out there who may have actually desired that I begin to teach uh, topics in literature in English. And actually is something that I'm very much at home with. Uh, I have actually written five novels that have been read in various schools in my country. I have also written and published other books, both as paperback and also the ebook editions. So literature is really uh, my area of specialization because literature is a very powerful tool for the use of language. I see literature as the demonstration field for the use of language. When you are knowledgeable about language, when you have acquired a language, of course, literature offers you the, uh, the opportunity to use language, such as when you write a book, you use language. You know, you use language practically in, you know, uh, various aspects of the narrative or the play or whatever literary genre you are actually producing. So having said that, I want to uh, use this video as a starting point of our various lessons on literature in English. And today we are looking at how to answer questions on general knowledge of literature. If you are new to this channel, kindly subscribe to the channel by clicking on the subscribe button below. Click also on the bell icon so that whenever new videos are uploaded on the channel, you will be notified instantly. Let's 
dive into the lesson. We are going to look at West African Senior School Certificate Examination of June 2020. Literature in English is the subject and the paper is the Objective Test Questions Part 1 Section A which is specifically general knowledge of literature or what we call literary appreciation. In this section, you are being tested, your knowledge of the literary terms is being tested. I see the literary terms as the, the building blocks or the working tools for appreciating and analyzing literature. And that is why Wyeck always uh, sets questions on it, because unless you really understand the literary terms, you won't be able to uh, go into real textual or literary anal analysis. So let's uh, begin to look at this one by one. Question one, a situation where an audience is aware of an action a character is ignorant of is a dramatic irony that actually is correct. I will explain. B, comic relief, no. C, aside, no. D, satire, no. Now, what is dramatic irony? Dramatic irony is a type of irony. And of course, irony is when you are saying one thing but you mean another. That is verbal irony. But dramatic irony is where an audience is aware of an action that a character is ignorant of. When you find a character in a play or a, a story and there is a situation that is known to those who are watching or reading the story, uh, but the character in the story is completely ignorant of that. All right, so that also actually invokes some uh, some suspense because that ignorance of that character is leading the character to take certain actions that will really backfire, and that will also propel the plot and increase the conflict, which of course what makes a good story or a good play. So the answer is dramatic irony. Now, comic relief is when uh, an aspect of, you know, when there is uh, something injected, a kind of uh, into a, a kind of uh, episode is in, injected or introduced into a tragic uh, play or story to douse tension. You know, when you have a very serious tragedy, uh, you find that the, the central character is facing a serious problem, probably a life-threatening problem, or you find a conflict that borders on probably, you know, uh, threats to the lives of the characters. And while this is going on, because of the tension generated, then, of course, there is need for comic relief. An aside is when a character or an actor in a play speaks directly to the audience, and which is generally believed to be unknown to the other actors in that play. Something similar is soliloquy, which is when a character is just thinking aloud and talking to himself or herself, all right? Then you have satire, which is a literary work that is devoted to ridiculing or making a mockery of certain uh, behaviors, certain human behaviors, you know, uh, highlighting the folly or the stupidity of certain actions of of humanity. That is satire. A work of art devoted to uh, doing that is a satire. Now, number two, we have a fictional prose, which is neither a novel nor a short story, is a allegory, 
No, be fable. No, see novella. Yes, I will explain why. The novelette. Well, novella and novelette are related because they all are, you know, related to the novel. But then, when we look at a novella, a novella is defined as a narrative form that is shorter than the novel, but longer than a short story. And where the novelette is actually out of it is that the novelette shares similar features with the short story. But then the question is a fictional prose, which is neither a novel nor a short story, and that is a novella. A novella is shorter than a novel, and a novella is longer than a short story. So it's really what uh, is required here. It's neither a novel nor a short story. A novella can be quoted with a short story. Number three, condensed use of language is a dominant feature of A, comedy, no, B, poetry, yes, I will explain. C, prose, no, D, tragedy, no. Comedy is just any story that, you know, has a happy ending or, you know, is really handling some lighter uh, issues, discussing some lighter issues, uh, is the opposite of tragedy that always uh, involves the death or the tragic end of uh, the protagonist, all right? So, so comedy is really, you can call it a, a genre or a subgenre of literature or specifically a type of drama or play we have four types of uh, we have different types of grammar let me not just limit it to a number of three or four but you have you have comedy you have tragedy you have tragic comedy of course you also have other types like fast satire and you have uh, 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 other types as well all right So comedy is actually out of it, as we can see. Then B is poetry, and that is really the answer, because poetry is the genre of literature that uses condensed language. It's, it's, uh, it makes use of condensed language uh, as its dominant feature. That's why you can find a poem that is a single stanza, where when you analyze it, you have volumes, you know, volumes of commentary uh, about it, because it uses condensed language, different poetic devices, you know, uses different figures of speech, creating imagery, and, of course, uses some use rhymes condensed language is the dominant feature of poetry prose is you know a novel a short story a novella a novelette and you know uh, that doesn't use condensed language tragedy is a kind of play and it uses uh, it uses it uses acts and scenes, all right? So actually, it doesn't use a condensed language, although it's a little bit more condensed than, um, than prose, yet it's really not uh, the condensed, it doesn't use condensed language like poetry, which sometimes is, using, is written in verse, uh, written, with all kinds of uh, metric uh, devices. Now, number four, the sudden reversal of a character's fortune in a literary work is A, denouement, no, B, 
B. Hamashia, no. C. Hubris, no. D. Peripetia, yes. I will explain. Denouement is the, the final resolution of, uh, a, of a conflict in play or story where you have a conflict or a serious problem facing a character and when it is finally resolved, that is denouement. Hamashia is a tragic flaw, something in the character, in the, in the behavior or life of a character that is really uh, wrong. It's a flaw, all right? Tragic flaw in a character. Hubris is also a type of Hamashia, a type of tragic flaw, but this refers specifically to excessive pride or overconfidence in the life of uh, especially the tragic character, which actually culminates in the fall of that character. If you look at uh, the play called Macbeth by William Shakespeare, you discover that uh, after receiving the false promises and assurances from the witches, Macbeth becomes so confident that he believes that no man born of a woman will be able to kill him. That is the assurance he receives from the witches. And this really gives him excessive, you know, confidence. And this eventually leads to his killing Duncan. And of course, uh, having killed Duncan, he has murdered sleep and he cannot rest until eventually he, 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 he is killed himself. So that is exactly what we mean by hubris, all right? That's hubris, excessive pride or confidence on the part of a tragic character. Now, peripetia is the sudden reversal of a character's fortune. It, it could be positive or negative. Of, of course, in tragedy, it's always, it's always negative. Now, talking about the same Macbeth, you discover that Macbeth eventually uh, after rising to the, the position of the military general and eventually ascending the throne of a king, he eventually gets killed. He, he falls, all right? So that is a sudden reversal of his fortune. is known as peripetia. Now let's uh, go to other questions. Now read the extract below and answer questions 5 to 7. Now this is the extract as we can see here. Let's look at the extract. Of course, this does not, this is not part of it. The extract ends here. Okay, so let's now read the extract. With the pain, he wrote kings into reality. With his words, kingdoms arose. Those same words, slaves inhaled, their hands building walls, their feet thumping on territories. His pain was like the breath of life. Wow, that's the extract. And now let's answer the questions. Question number five. The underlined words illustrate a hyperbole. Yes, I will explain why. B, irony, no. C, metonymy, no. And D, paradox, no. Why is it hyperbole? And what is hyperbole, by the way? Hyperbole is a literary device that makes use of exaggeration or overstatement. That's what hyperbole is all about. Now let's look at the underlined expression and see why it is hyperbole. With his words, kings, kingdoms arose. You can see this is an overstatement. You know, you you is you know, so it's something is overstated here. Just with his words, kingdoms arose. So that really an ex obvious exaggeration here. All right. Then other options are out of it. Irony is 
when you say one thing but have another thing in mind for instance someone comes late to a meeting and the chairman says wow you are a very a perfect example of punctuality coming almost an hour you know after the meeting started so that's an irony then metonymy is using uh, something that is related to another thing to replace it for example if you are talking about the king and you 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 use the crown as a, something to replace the king all right you when people say on easy lies the head that wears the crown all right so that may not be a perfect one but at least a mention of the crown or let me give another example you want to talk about the government of the united states and instead of saying the united states government uh, then you say the white house all right the white house is the seat of the government and you can use the white house to symbolize or represent that government that is actually metonymy or when you want to talk about a king and you talk about the scepter or you want to talk about the judges and the lawyers and you talk about the wig and the gown you know using something that is related or you use the pen to represent writers and you use the gun to represent the military so that is metonymy paradox is a statement that combines two opposite ideas it, 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 you know that is a, a statement that combines two opposite ideas for example if you say that attack is the best form of defense of course attack and defense are two opposite ideas and when you place them side by side in a statement that is a paradox question number six hands and feet in line four illustrate a contrast b litotis these are no no all of them uh, c personification no D, Sinedeki. Yes, that's the correct option here because Sinedeki really has to do with. Uh, let's wipe this because we, we have um, some of these marks from the previous page we treated. So let's wipe them so that they will not confuse us here. All right. Well, the actual marks we have given on this page are the one for hyperbole and the one for synedeki. All right. So now synedeki is actually the a literary device that you know uses the part to represent the whole. For example, you are looking at hands, which are parts of the human body, to represent the human being and feet also parts that represent human being when you talk of hands and feet you are talking about people so if you say for instance all hands must be on deck that is using hands to represent human beings instead of saying that uh, every all all persons have to really uh, collaborate or uh, join hands or uh, uh, you know cooperate to see that things are done the right way you know so that is what synedeki is about contrast is when you are looking at differences between uh, two or more things now litotis is understatement is the opposite of hyperbole hyper hyper uh, high, uh, i mean light litotis please get it right litosis that's actually the correct pronunciation it it means understatement for example, if someone uh, so makes a brilliant suggestion and you say it's, it's not a bad idea, a very good, very wonderful idea, but instead of praising it highly, you simply say it's, it's not a bad idea. Or you see a very beautiful woman 
Uh, but instead of saying this is a very stunning, this is a very, a very pretty woman, you say it, she doesn't look bad, you know. So understatement is lightotis, and so it's not what we are looking for here. Personification is when you describe non-human entities with human qualities. For instance, if you say that um, the, the sky is smiling, for example, the sky is not a human being to have the quality of smiling, but when you describe the sky in that way, you are using personification. All right, so the answer to number six is Sinebeki, which is using part for a whole. Number seven, his pain was like the breath of life, exemplifies A, Bathos, B, Pathos, uh, A is no, is not Bathos, B, Pathos, no, C, Satire, no, T, Smile, yeah, I mean Simile, <laughs> Simile, all right? Now, let me explain. His pain was like the breath of life. Whenever you find an expression where pain is likened to the breath of life, you know, when you compare one thing to another using any of the words like or as or resemble, then you are using similar. Now, similar is a little bit. Uh, Sim, uh, similar to metaphor, but metaphor is, uh, you know, saying that one thing is another without using any of these uh, words like or as. If you say Samson was a lion, all right, in strength, that Samson was a lion in strength, then you are using metaphor. But if you say that uh, Samson was like a lion, then you are using simile. So now you can understand this. Now, battles, uh, battles has to do with um, trying to descend from the sublime to the ridiculous. All right? When you are describing something and you, you now... Uh, you are talking of something very glorious, and all of a sudden you you end up uh, describing it as something shameful or ridiculous. You know Th that is battles. It's, it's a kind of literary device. All right. For instance, you are talking of someone uh, driving a limousine, and all of a sudden you are now depicting him as uh, riding a bicycle, for example. Well, it's not a perfect example, but just to give you some insight into what we mean by battles. Now, pathos is when you the literary device is intended to invoke some feelings or emotions in the audience probably with a view to getting the audience to sympathize with the character, you know, to be sympathetic towards the character or to have a soft spot for that character. That is pathos. Then satire, I have already explained a literary work that uh, ridicules a particular uh, aspect of human behavior. Now, simile, we have already explained so you already know what a simile is. His pain was like the breath of life is an example of simile. So let's proceed. Question number eight, but first let's wipe our marks so that we won't um, take them for a fresh one or mistake them for a fresh one. Now, question number eight. Comic relief occurs in A, comedies, no, B, pastorals, no, C, romance, no, D, tragedies, yes. Now, 
A tragedy is a work of art that handles a very serious issue and it involves serious conflict confronting the central character. Probably threat to life or even in some cases you, you find uh, people being killed and all that. So it's something that really invokes, you know, creates some tension in the minds of the audience. And that is the reason for introducing comic relief, a kind of episode that, uh, you know, introduces, that creates a, a lighter mood so that, uh, you know, some kinds of jokes or some kind of ridiculous, you know, uh, or foolish behavior of a particular character that, you know, just makes people laugh so that uh, they will uh, try to reduce the tension already building up in them as a result of probably what the central character in a tragedy is being subjected to. Now, number nine, one week of fasting makes one week is an example of A, apostrophe, no, B, paradox, no, C, pawn, yes, I will explain. D, sarcasm, no. Now, what is an apostrophe and why is it not the answer to this? An apostrophe is uh, something in a work of art or a literary uh, device in which, you know, a narrator probably addresses an absent person or something that is really not present in that environment. Let me give you an example. You know, a young man loses the husband suddenly. The husband dies and the woman in her lamentation begins to address death as if death were a human being that you could face and begin to talk to. All right? You will find a similar thing in uh, a poem called Death Be Not Proud, written by a metaphysical poet known as John Donne. In that poem, uh, the narrator is addressing death, an abstract and absent concept. All right, so that is apostrophe. Paradox refers to a statement that combines two opposite ideas. I already explained that. So it's really not what uh, we are looking at here. Pawn is a play on words, and that is what is happening here. And it always involves words that sound the same, that have similar sound. You see, week, which is, you know, uh, seven days uh, that make one week. You know, one week of fasting makes one week. The week here is W-E-A-K, which has to do with the, when someone is not strong. So these two words uh, sound alike, and so it's a play on words. Let me give you a, an example of, of playing on words, which is what porn is about. If I say that Rose, that is a, a woman, you know, Rose, Rose from where she was sitting and went to look at the roses out there in the garden. You see, I've mentioned three words that sound alike but have different meaning. The first word rose is a person, a woman. Then rose is an action. That is the past tense of rise. You know, rose rose from where she was and went to survey the roses out there in the garden. The other last rose, which is uh, rose, pluralized, roses, refer to flowers, all right? So that is a play on words. Sarcasm is the use of irony to make a very harsh comment uh, or bad comment on someone, all right? If, if, if for instance, you know, someone 
who, for instance, divorced the wife and uh, is trying to talk to uh, uh, talk to others about how to uh, be a good husband. And then you you know about it and you say, well, uh, you are actually the be the perfect example. You are an epitome of uh, what a good husband is supposed to be, which of course is why you divorced your wife after uh, maiming her, something like that, you know. So what you are saying is that you, 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 in one breath, you are describing him as a perfect example of a good husband. Uh, and then you are also saying that, you know, you are saying something that nullifies uh, that description, that which shows actually that is a very bad husband. All right. So that is sarcasm. Or someone has broken the plate and, you know, you begin to say that, if you are looking for a careful person, this is the, the, the person uh, you are actually looking for. Each time she is sent to wash plates in the kitchen, at least one or two plates must be broken. You know, so sarcasm, you know, is when you use irony to make a bad comment about someone. Now, Number 10, students rarely read Julius Caesar these days. Illustrate A, Caesora, Caesora, but that's not the answer. B, eponym, yeah, that's the answer. I will explain. C, oxymoron, no. D, zygma, zygma, that also is not the answer. Now let's look at these literary terms one by one. Like I said earlier, literary terms are the working tools you need for analyzing literature. And this is why we are really discussing this, because when you understand the various literary terms, they will enable you to analyze literature with ease. Now, students rarely read Julius Caesar these days, illustrate a caesura. No, caesura is actually a pause or a break in a line of poetry. For example, if you have a line uh, similar to Shakespeare's uh, to be or not to be, you know, then you discover that in that line, to be or not to be, after to be, you have a comma, and that indicates a pause, to be or not to be. The, so when you have a line of poetry that really uh, indicates a pause, something like that, a break, that is called caesura. Now, eponym uh, it refers to a play or a book uh, whose title is the central character. Now, Julius Caesar is a play by William Shakespeare. The title is Julius Caesar, and the, the central character is Julius Caesar as well. That is an eponym, or you can describe it as an eponymous, eponymous play, all right? And Julius Caesar is, the, is an eponymous character. Now, you have another play by William Shakespeare, which I earlier referred to, which is Macbeth. I don't know if I've already referred to it. Macbeth, of course, is also an eponym because Macbeth is the title of the play, and Macbeth is the central character in that play as well. So when you have a book like that, that is an eponym or an eponymous book, all right? So that is actually the answer. Students rarely read Julius Caesar these days. Illustrate a caesura. So sometimes you, if you don't know that Julius Caesar is the play as well as the character, then you'll be wondering whether this guy is talking about Julius Caesar, the one we know in history, 
ou de leur César, é, é, é particular book. Alright? Then C, oxymoron. Oxymoron is uh, the use of a, 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 or a combination of two opposite ideas is similar to paradox, which I explained earlier. But the difference is quite clear. Paradox is a statement, as I earlier said. On the other hand, oxymoron is a phrase, you know, a phrase. Now, let me uh, refer back to paradox. It's a statement. For example, attack is the best form of defense. That's a statement. And then we have attack, we have defense. These two opposite ideas are contained in that statement. Now, oxymoron uh, uses a phrase that combines two ideas, you know, placed side by side. For example, if you say, Jack is the wisest fool I have ever seen, then wisest fool is oxymoron. Because wisest and fool gives you idea of two things that actually are opposite to each other. And then you put two of them together. Or if you say it was a bitter sweet experience, that is oxymoron. Bitter and sweet put together in a phrase. That is what oxymoron is about. And you can see the, the difference between oxymoron and paradox. All right. Zygma refers to, you know, a word that is used to refer to two different things. A single word used to refer to two different things. For example, if I tell you that I lost my friend and lost my heart, right? Now, the word lost is used to refer to two different things. My friend and my heart. I lost my friend and lost my heart. So, you see, that's exactly... Uh, what Zygma does, and that is really not the answer to this question. But I have explained each of these concepts so that when, whenever you meet each of them, you will understand what they refer to. Question number 11. In literature, the term poetic justice applies to a story that ends well that is not the answer because a story that ends well can be described as a comedy. B, characters that are spared death. That's not the answer. That's not what poetic justice is all about. C, the development of a good plot. No, a plot is the arrangement of events in a story. But that's a different thing altogether. D, the rewarding of good characters and the punishing of bad ones. That, of course, is what poetic uh, justice is about. Because in real life, you know, because of morality, all right, and the understanding of what moral justice is all about, people expect that the wicked should be punished and the righteous should be rewarded which, in fact, is also a biblical principle. And in a good work of art, poetic justice presupposes that a wicked character should be punished, should have a, a, you know, a, a very bad ending, while a good character should have a rewarding ending. So that is poetic justice. Now, question number 12, ascribing human moods to nature, as in playful breeze, illust playful breeze. Now, what does this illust illustrate? A, humor, no. B, pathetic fallacy, no. Uh, of course, yes, pathetic fallacy, I will explain. Then, of course, uh, we have uh, C, which of course, is, uh, is in this uh, question, but is hidden in our screen. Let me read it out from the, the question. We are dealing with question number 12. And uh, option C, 
is symbolism and that also is not the answer. D is transferred epithet is not the answer. Now humor we know is something, a kind of joke or anything that really makes people to laugh. The song, anything funny is, is humor, all right? Then B is pathetic fallacy. And this has to do with when you ascribe human moods to nature. If you, if you talk about playful breeze, breeze is an aspect of, of nature. And breeze, of course, is, is, a, is nature and it's not a human being. Human beings are, can be expected to be playful. So when you ascribe this mood of playfulness to breeze, which is nature, that is pathetic fallacy. All right? Or when you talk of angry wind, you know, the, the feeling of anger, you now ascribe it to the wind, which is an aspect of nature. That also is pathetic fallacy. All right? So you can now understand what pathetic fallacy is all about. And of course, when we are looking at pathetic fallacy, is it resembles personification. Personification is describing a non-human entity with human qualities. For instance, when you say the sky is smiling, that, of, of course, is personification. But there's a slight difference between pathetic fallacy and uh, personification. All right, so let's uh, go over to the next screen. But of course, uh, let's have a clean screen so we'll be able to see clearly and uh, know when we are looking at a new question altogether. Now, question number 13, the end of a performance is followed by a, a cutting call. That is correct, and I will explain why. B, cutting razor, no. C, epilogue, no. D, interlude, no. Now, a cutting call is, you know, what follows a performance. When you have a spectacular performance that is, that elicits a loud uh, applause, very, uh, very big applause from the from the audience. So much so that the the performers who probably have left the stage, uh, one or some of them, uh, have to come back to the stage to acknowledge the applause of the audience. You know that is a curtain call. Now, a cutting razor uh, is probably uh, a play that comes at the beginning or an episode that comes at the beginning. Now, cutting razor uh, gives you an uh, idea of raising the curtain, you know, to open the stage. So it's a cutting razor. Now, an epilogue is uh, a kind of... Uh, a, a description, you know, something written at the end of a book or a play, you know, that is an epilogue. And it has, it refers to a book, but when we talk of a cutting call, it specifically applies to a performance on stage, all right? Uh, the opposite of epilogue is prologue. A prologue is what is something that is written to introduce a book or something. It comes uh, at the beginning. Epilogue comes at the end of the book. Then interlude is something that comes in between episodes, all right? Now let's move on. Read the lines and answer question 14, okay? Let's now look at this. The lines are marching along 50 score strong Great-hearted gentleman singing this song. All right? Question 14. The underlying words illustrate A, assonance. Yes, assonance. I will explain. B, consonance. No. C, onomatopoeia. No. T, repetition. No. Now, 
assonance is the repetition of the cons of the vowel sounds in a line of, of poetry and we can see it here the word along on the line here has the vowel sound oh. all right then the word strong also has the vowel sound strong all right so you have a long a long strong and you have the other one similar to which is core although that one has the long vowel sound then in line two also we have the the vowel sound or also in song all right so this is what we call assonance and consonance is when you have a uh, when you have a uh, consonant sounds repeated in a line of poetry all right that is consonance onomatopoeia is describing an object or an entity uh, according to its sound all right when you describe something the way it sounds of course like when you talk of the cracking you know the the cracking wall or something or the splash of water you know or the you, you, something you know that actually the the hissing sound of the wind is that is on onomatopoeia right repetition has to do with you know uh, re the uh, repeating certain words or certain expressions in a work of art so you can understand now why the option the right option the correct option is assonance all right number 15 a short poem with a witty or sarcastic ending is a ballad no b allegory no c epigram yes i will explain then d panegyric panegyric well let's begin to look at them one by one a ballad is a a a poem that uses a short story you know a, that is is either a poem or a song that you know presents the message in form of a story all right then allegory is a work of art that uses symbols uh, and sometimes uses ideas as characters a typical example is Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. If you have read that book, of course, you discover that some characters or most of the characters are ideas like faith, hope, power, and so on and so forth. All right, love. So these are ideas and they are portrayed as characters. And normally, an allegory uh, teaches moral lessons. Now, Epigram is the answer here. That is a short poem with a witty or sarcastic ending. It, it, it says something brilliant and sometimes sarcastic, you know. Now, panegyric is similar to ode, uh, and that is a poem that, or a, a poem that addresses a uh, a person or an object when you talk of uh, an ode to a nightingale an ode is always a, a poem that is devoted to praising a particular person or institution or concept or idea all right so that actually is a uh, panegyric sometimes it could be a public speech all right all right, so question number 16. The big boulder blaster the house. Uh, that is the expression here. The big boulder blaster the house uh, illustrates A, alliteration, yes. I will explain why. B, contrast, no. C, irony, no. D, paradox, no. 
Now, alliteration is the repetition of the initial consonant sound in a line of poetry. And here you can see big, bolder blaster, BBB, you know, so it's a repetition of the initial consonant sound in these three words. That is what we call alliteration. All right, so contrast, we have already explained when you begin to look at the differences between one thing and another. Well, irony, we have already uh, talked about, and paradox, we have also talked about. Now, let's move on, all right? Uh, first, let's uh, try to clean, wipe the screen so we won't be confused when we go to the next page, all right? Okay, now, let's go to question 17 but first we have an extract to read read the extract and answer questions 17 and 18 now here we find the extract here okay no it doesn't extend to that question 17 so let's wipe this okay so let's look at the extract i find no peace and all my war is done I fear and hope, I burn and freeze like ice. Wow. Then question 17, the dominant literary device used in the lines is A, euphemism, no, B, hyperbole, no, C, paradox, no. Mm. Paradox, yes. All right, I will explain why. Paradox, yes. D, understatement, no. Well, let's look at this one by one. A, euphemism. Euphemism is when you use polite or good words to refer to a nasty or bad situation. For example, if someone dies and you say he has, he has uh, passed on or he has been translated to glory. You are using good words to describe a bad situation. That is euphemism, all right? And then B is hyperbole, which is exaggeration. We already explained this. C is paradox, which we also explain. But let's look at why this is paradox. Paradox is a statement that combines two opposite ideas. We explain this uh, repeatedly, but let's apply it here. Why is this paradox? Line one, I find no peace and all my war is done. You know that peace and war are two opposite ideas and these ideas are put together in this statement. I find no peace and all my war is done. Of course, you expect that when you are no longer fighting any war, your war is done, you, you, you ought to find peace. But it's saying, I find no peace and all my war is done. But what we find here is peace and war are combined in this statement. That makes it paradoxical. And when you look at a paradox on the surface, it seems to be, to be untrue, but when you really examine it, you find some element of truth in it. And so it becomes, appears a little bit confusing until you, you really analyze it and think about it critically. Then line two, I fear and hope. You can see fear and hope are opposites. I fear and hope. You know, this is a statement and it combines two ideas, which is what paradox is about. Then the second ex uh, statement here, I burn and freeze like ice. Burn and freeze refer to a hot situation and a cold situation, which of course are two opposite ideas. So that is why we refer to this as paradox. Now let's look at question 18. The feeling, of course, uh, understatement, which I call litotis, you know it, all right? When it is, uh, it, that's the opposite of hyperbole. If you look at something uh, that, you know, uh, 
instead of talking about it, highlighting it, you just understate it. You know, that's a literary device. Okay? Question number 18. The feeling of the narrator in the extracts is one of A, confusion, which is correct. B, fatigue, no. C, love, no. D, joy, no. I already mentioned that on the surface, when you look at a, para, a paradox or a paradoxical statement, uh, you, you think it is untrue, you know, until you really look closely at it and then you begin to decipher the hidden truth in it. So at, at first, it really appears confusing. So it gives you a feeling of confusion. Fatigue is, you know, the feeling of tiredness, but that's not what is being invoked here. Love also is not what is being invoked here. Joy is also out of it. Question number 19. Which of the following is written by an African playwright? A. She stoops to conquer. No. B. A raisin in the sun. No. C. Lonely days. No. D. The blood of a stranger. No. Uh, uh, yes, of course. This last option is yes. I will explain why. Now, which of the following is written by an African playwright? Now, let's look at option A. She Stoops to Conquer is a play, but written by a non-African playwright. That is uh, uh, Oliver Golding, right? Um, then B, a, a Resin in the Sun, is also a non-African play that actually portrays racism in america in the in the olden time all right probably after abolition of the slave trade and the whites were still discriminating against the black americans right in the africans in the american society that's a reason in the song is a play you know unlike um <clears throat> what's the other book uh you know, native song, you know, is 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 a is a pro is prose, but this is actually a play. This a resin in the sun is written by Lauren Hansberry, uh, a non-African uh, playwright. Then option C is Lonely Days. This of course is out of it because this is it is actually written by an African, but it is a novel, so it's written by an African novelist, but certainly not an African playwright. A playwright writes a play or drama. Option D is correct because The Blood of a Stranger is a play written by an African playwright called uh, mm, uh, Chile, right? Um, what's the name of this uh, particular uh, writer? And uh, that is actually an African playwright. All right? That I, I will actually uh, remember the name. It's, uh, it's, it's an African playwright that has actually written this play. The Blood of a Stranger is, uh, is a very wonderful play that actually depicts uh, certain events in an African setting, all right? Uh, and that playwright is called Dele Charlie. Dele Charlie is an African playwright and he is the writer of uh, The Blood of a Stranger. Then, question number 20, which is the last but not the least. Which of the following is written by a non-African poet? So take note, we are looking for a poet and a non-African. Option A is piano and drums. No. B. 
the dining table, no? See, the school boy, yes, I will explain. Did the panic of growing older, no? Now, A is piano and drums. This is a poem, actually, but it's an Afri African poem written by Gabriel Okara, one of the pioneers of African poetry and piano and drums is really out of it. B is the dining table written by Barnabam Hallowell. Sometimes I find the name job breaking somehow. Uh, but it's an African poet, all right? The dining table is a poem that really uh, is somehow paradoxical, if you like, because when you look at the title dining table, you begin to think that it is a table where you will be served with good and delicious meals to eat. But on the contrary, it is talking about a worse situation. All right? Then the schoolboy is a poem written by a non-African poet, actually a non-African poet, and it's a very wonderful one written by William Blake, the schoolboy. So that actually is the answer. The Panic of Growing Older is an African poet, poem, all right? So that's, this is exactly where we are going to draw the curtain uh, in today's uh, video. I want to believe that you have actually taken away some very, very important lessons from today's uh, episode. Uh, we have been actually looking at literature in English, West African Senior School Certificate Examination 2021 Preparatory Lesson. And our focus has been on how to answer questions on general knowledge of literature. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, two of you out there specifically requested for video lessons on literature in English. And this is the first video on literature. So I want to give a shout out to these two uh, very wonderful subscribers, Abu Kamara and Quotes and Stories. If you are watching this video, really I have actually fulfilled my promise to always respond to your requests and suggestions and I have done that by uploading this video. But I also want to promise that this is just the beginning of our journey into literature, literary appreciation, and a lot more will come. So I want to give a shout out to two of you and a big thank you to all of you out there, all of you, my subscribers, my viewers you are all wonderful and you are highly esteemed and of course this is not the first video that i am uploading in response to your requests most of you who have made one request or the other and uh, who have gotten my prompt request will actually attest to this if you have made any request or suggestions and i have not responded to it rest assured that i will actually respond to it i want you to know that you are the reason why i am doing what i'm doing on this channel and if you are new to the channel kindly subscribe to the channel by so by clicking on the subscribe button below click on the bell icon as well so that whenever i upload a new video you will be informed instantly so you won't miss any new video on this channel uh, I also want you to know that if you have really enjoyed this video, 
you should like the video and share it with your friends and relations. I want you to know that this channel is really a place to be uh, because you can see that with the addition of literature in English, we now have three very important areas of knowledge that we share on this channel. We teach English, the, the English language, various aspects of English language, all the areas of language proficiency. We teach uh, English uh, language writing skills. We teach phonetics and phonology, that is orals, oral English. We teach summary writing, we teach comprehension, we teach letter writing, we teach all aspects of essay writing, we teach, you know, various aspects of language learning, punctuation, you know, capitalization, name it. And of course, we have given you a blank check. If you have any uh, topic that gives you some uh, difficulties, you just mention it and we are going to discuss it on this channel by the special grace of god and with the knowledge that we have acquired you know we will share these ideas with you and today you you can see that we have introduced literature so we will also be teaching literature on this channel and you also know that we share ideas on content writing because those of you who actually uh, have learned English language, you know that language is the biggest tool, the most effective tool for creating content. Of course, you know that, you and I know that language is the most powerful tool for creating content. And so if you are an, an expert in language use, of course you are an expert in content creation. And that is why we have actually blended these three, you know, areas of knowledge. English language, English, uh, uh, literature in English, and content creation. And the, the gains of content creation cannot really be overemphasized because when you talk of content creation, you talk of content marketing, digital marketing, internet marketing, then everything that has to do with doing business online, of course, has to do with content creation. For example, you, you can see that I created this YouTube channel and I am using language to create content on this channel. And that is actually why you are receiving value on, on this channel. And that is why a, a so many people out there have really subscribed to this channel. We started this channel not long ago, where we have crossed the thousand, a thousand uh, subscribers mark. So that actually is a testimony to the fact that this channel is doing very well. And I can tell you that that's the power of language use. We are using language here to create content in three very distinct uh, though interrelated areas and which are equally important so and if you subscribe to this channel if you are part of this channel really really you will learn quite a lot i want to thank you for being part of today's episode i want to thank you for really encouraging us you have been a huge encouragement to us. Without your support, we couldn't have come uh, to uh, the length that we have come to uh, uh, in this on this channel. So thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all. I wish you well in whatever you are doing. And I pray that God Almighty might also reward you for actually supporting this channel. Uh, I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye.